Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case I'm going to be looking into today is the case of Robert Marshall. This case was suggested by Donald, so thank you for that. I appreciate any suggestions you guys have. And of course, if you do have any more, please do let me know. Robert Oakley Marshall was born on the 16th of December in 1939 to parents Howard Marshall and Oakley Valentine Weeks in Queens of New York. His father was a sporting goods salesman. I'm going to refer to him as Rob because, you know, that's how he was commonly known. Rob would be the eldest of five children. He would go to Villanova University and he graduated there in 63. That same year, he completed his Navy flight training and that was on the 22nd of November. Then in December of the same year, so clearly that year was very busy for him, he ended up marrying a woman called Maria Pozinski Marshall. The pair had actually met at a high school party after Rob's parents moved to the area that she lived in. Maria grew up in Philadelphia in a Polish neighbourhood of Port Richmond. Her father was a doctor and of course Rob and Maria met and fell in love and then got married. She was described as being a beautiful woman. She had lovely blonde hair. She was so caring and loving and was just such an easygoing person. They ended up having three children together and she was described as a brilliant mother. She even would end up being a stay-at-home mom for her kids. She wanted to be there for them. She wanted to do everything for them and so she stayed at home with them. Rob eventually went on to become a life insurance salesman for Provident Mutual Life in Philadelphia. Robert was very much described as quite an arrogant, egotistical man who could often be overbearing at times. So the children that they had together, the first child was called Robbie Marshall. Then a year later, they had the next son, Christopher Marshall. Then there would be like a five year gap before they had the final son, John Marshall. And they seemed like a very happy family on the outside but maybe not so much on the inside. Or at least that's what it seemed like. In 1973, the family moved to the Brookside section of Tom's River and there they made the home. They did went to the local country club. They settled in really quickly and, you know, loved their life there. Rob and Maria would love to often travel down to Atlantic City where they would go and dine and have gambling sessions and things like that. They did it quite often. I believe it was like an hour away from their home, like an hour's drive, but it was something they loved to do and they would do it quite often. I think it was more Rob than Maria that wanted to go, but it was something that they did together more often than not. This then brings us to the horrific events of the 7th of September in 1984. Let me just say at this point, Robert is 44 years old, Maria is 42, Robbie is 19, Christopher was 18 and John was 13. Just to put into perspective the ages and a bit about their lives, Robbie was attending the same university as his father. He was also taking classes at his local community college and had a job with intentions to return to university in the spring. Christopher was a freshman at Lehigh University and John was actually in the eighth grade. So Robert and Maria had on this day planned to go down to Atlantic City like they had done so often before. They were going to have an evening of dining and gambling and then come home. So they had been there, they were on the way home. Maria was actually lied across Rob's lap because she was tired and she was dozing off. They were out around 10 minutes away from actually getting home when Robert feels the car shaking. Well, I don't even know shaking is the right word, but he feels like something's off in the 1988 Cadillac El Dorado. And so he pulls over into Oyster Creek picnic area. Now, this area was very dark, it was very secluded, it wasn't exactly straight off the main road, so it's not like one turn, you can see it off the main road. It was quite, not super far in, but far enough in so that people from the main road couldn't see people there, kind of thing. So, he gets out, he goes around to the tyre and begins looking at that, thinking that maybe he has a flat, there's something not right with this car. And then, bam, he smacked over the head with something and knocked unconscious. After some time, he wakes up and he obviously is dazed he's wondering what on earth's going on he has a head injury through being knocked out and he goes to check on maria he finds that she is lying face down in pretty much the same position that she was when he left her but she was deceased she had two gunshot wounds to her back chest area so after just just after 12 30 a.m which is why it's on the 7th 
Obviously, they went out on the 6th, but it's now crossed over midnight, so it is now the 7th of September. And Rob is desperately trying to flag down somebody to help him. He's near the entrance of the road to get to the picnic area, and somebody finally does eventually stop. He tells them that his wife has been murdered, that he has been attacked, and that they need to call the police. So they rush over to the nearest payphone, they call the police, and then they come back to the scene. When they return, they see Rob sort of pacing around and that he is visibly bleeding from a head wound and that Maria was unfortunately deceased in the car. When police arrive, they ask what had happened. He tells them that they were on the way home. He pulled in to look at his tyre, believing that it was flat and then he heard another car drive in but he never heard anyone get out of it or anything and you know, the next thing he knows, he's knocked out and he comes to and his wife's dead. But at this point, they'd already checked Maria for a pulse and there was none. He said that when he woke up, the money that he had won at the casino had gone, which apparently was over $15,000 and obviously his wife had been murdered. I believe that actually only $2,000 was actually taken from his pocket, but it was supposed to be $15,000 and you'll see, you'll see what I'm going on about as we get through this case. So Maria's body was taken for an autopsy. They found she had two bullet wounds about three millimeters apart in her back and one bullet had exited straight away, but the other one had actually got lodged in her left forearm because it's believed that when she was shot, she was actually sort of lying on the arm so that when the bullet went through, it would have gone through and through, but then it, her arm was there too, so it ended up in her arm. They found the bullet was a 45 caliber bullet and they basically came to the conclusion that she had died due to blood loss, massive hemorrhaging because her left lung had been nicked and one of her main arteries and she just would have bled out very quickly. So things are looking at a little bit strange if you ask me at this point because you've got Maria who has been fatally shot in the car and then you've got Rob who was simply hit over the head. Now my question at this point was why was Maria the one that was killed? If somebody was going to rob these people they could have knocked them both out. They knocked Rob out why didn't they knock, Mar knock Maria out too? If they planned on killing them, why did they only kill Maria and not Rob? It, it didn't make much sense to me. But there you go. Rob was injured, obviously. He was taken to hospital where he had five stitches in his head. He then had to go home and break the horrible, tragic news to his children that their mother was dead. So he told, I believe he told Robbie and John, and obviously everyone's devastated about losing Maria. And then he ended up having to drive out to tell Chris because Chris was in uni, I believe. The police wanted Rob to come in to make a final statement and this is when it was breaking all over the news. All family members were like distant, were getting informed about this. All friends were offering their condolences to Rob. He went to the police station and he gave a statement. He said the same thing, but a little bit more information this time. He said that he had won $2,000 on the blackjack table and that from that somebody must have followed him home. They must have seen him win it. They must have followed him home to try and rob him. And when he got out to check his tire, you know, they thought that that was a great opportunity to attack. More information came to light the more the police looked into it though. After Maria's autopsy, Rob sent her body to be cremated like very quickly after on the 10th of September and according to his sons he seemed to be coping with it really well whereas Robbie was really not. At some point during all this Rob's brother-in-law comes down so I'm guessing I don't know it must have been Maria's brother. Anyway his brother-in-law comes down and has a little chat with him. He is a an attorney. He comes to speak to Rob about something that Rob didn't really think that anybody knew about. He tells him that he knew, and so did Maria, that Rob was having an affair. This woman was called Saran Karausha, and I probably said that wrong, I'm sorry if I have, but they had actually met at Country Club, I believe some over a year before, and they had began an affair. Rob honestly believe that nobody knew about it but Maria did. She actually found some receipts and hotel bills and put it all together and they showed that they were having like 50 calls between the pair a month which is a lot. So obviously she's gonna know something's going on. At this point Rob really couldn't do anything but admit it to be honest. He admitted and said that he was having an affair, he was having a midlife crisis, that he was depressed and bored and that's where he began to look elsewhere to cure all of that. 
he said that him and Saran were actually in love. They both had spouses and according to Rob and it would later be corroborated by Saran, they were both going to leave those spouses and then begin their relationship together properly. So, let me just lay it out for you. You've got a wife deceased. You have a husband cheating. Now, those things never really look very well together at all. And the more that came out, the more the worse it looked. They actually found out that Rob was actually in a load of debt too. By August of 1984, no debtors, credit cards, banks or anything were giving him any more loans or like allowing him to increase his limit on what he already had because he owed that much money out. He actually went ahead and blamed that on Maria's spending habits but, you know, don't know the ins and outs of it. I, obviously, I know that the pair like to gamble so gambling is never good. A lot of people fall into the unfortunate trap of say you lose some money, you spend more money to try and get that money back and you end up in a massive hole. So whether that was the case with these, I don't know. I don't really, I wouldn't really like to speculate on that. But obviously with gambling in the picture, it could very well have been the reason as to why he ended up, they ended up in so much debt. As I said, Maria knew about the affair. Apparently she was going to confront Rob on the 10th of September about it. And she'd obviously told her brother about it, which is how he came and knew about it and spoke to Rob about it. She told him also that she'd hired a private detective to follow Rob. And then he said something really, 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 really strange. And that's a lot of reallys, but it was very strange. He said that if only he had knew about the private detective, none of this would have happened. Yeah, I told you it was weird. Why would somebody say that? But then he kind of just brushed it under the rug because he just basically said that if he had known that Maria knew about the affair, that he would have left her sooner and then they would have never gone to Atlantic City that day and she would have never been murdered. One thing I haven't yet mentioned is don't forget that Rob was a life insurance salesman. His brother-in-law asked him if Maria had life insurance. He said yes he did and that it was a good sales strategy according to Rob and that at the time of her death she was $1.5 million, which is insane. So after all this discussion that they had had and all this information that they had found out, he basically gave Rob a bit of advice and told him, tell your children about the affair before it gets out on the news and they find out from somebody else because that would be horrible to find out. And basically said, you know how this looks, don't you? How everything, all that you've told me, all of this information looks on you. Like he's having an affair. He's in debt up to his eyeballs. His wife is insured for $1.5 million. And then suddenly, you know, He's attacked whilst out on the road checking a tyre and his wife is killed and he is not. It, yeah, it just looks not good. Rob basically said that he understood what he was trying to tell him, but that the police wouldn't be looking into him at all. That he was this big shot in Tom's River and that would place him beyond reproach from the law, which is just ridiculous because not only is the husband one of the first people that police look into anyway, because it's normally them that have committed the crime, you know, and then all of these strange things that are suspicious around him that could be more convenient and more motive for him to commit such a crime, obviously the police are going to talk to him. You know, it didn't really work. They did go and speak to him. But it just goes to show, like, how much he thought of himself. Like, I'm a big shot. They won't come to me. So you've got people who supported Rob throughout all this. They thought that the story that he was telling was true. And then you got a load of people around him that thought what he was spewing was just utter garbage. People began asking questions like, why did he stop in a desolate picnic area? Apparently, just up the road, there was a 24-hour food restaurant up there that he could have easily stopped in if he wanted to look at his tyre, but instead he drives off-road into this dark picnic area and just, why did he do it? It was just so weird. Why did he choose that area? It's not like his tyre was flat, like a pancake, and that he had to stop there and then. And even if, even if it was, you'd stop on the side of the road. You wouldn't drive into a picnic area and carry on driving on that tire. It just, it just was, was so strange. People also went ahead and said that Rob never did manual labor so they couldn't see him changing a tire. But I mean, come on, if you've got a flat tire and you can't go anywhere, you either ring for some help or you try and change the tire yourself. I've never changed a tire before, never had to, but I'd give it a damn good go if I was the only person there and I was stuck. Do you know what I mean? You'd, you'd try. So even if you're not a labourer, doesn't mean that you wouldn't go ahead and try and change a tyre. That didn't really make sense to me. Also, the fact that Rob was so quick to cremate her body, it was actually done that quickly that the prosecutor's office 
didn't get a chance to stop the body from being released. He literally, after that autopsy, he literally got it cremated straight away. They didn't even have the chance to try and stop that from happening. So if there was any more need to look into her body further, they couldn't because it was gone. When police impounded the car, they found that the tire, the rear tire had actually a slash mark down it. It was a one inch cut down the side of the tire and it basically looked like it had been split open with a knife. Not that they had run over something and it had got a slow puncture or popped that way or anything like that. It looked like it was deliberately cut. So but police went ahead and spoke to Maria's lawyer. She, you know, knew about the affair. She knew about the detective that they had hired, all of that lo- that stuff. She told them that Maria had actually told her to hold off on anything with regards to that. I'm guessing she was looking more into it. But she did give the police a record of three telephone numbers with a Louisiana area code and that was handed over to the police. When the police looked into that, they found that one of these numbers belonged to a man called Robert Cumber. They go and question him. He said that he met Rob in May of 84 at this party. He got talking to him and he asked him if he knew of a private investigator that Rob could hire. This is where Billy Way McKinnon's name was mentioned and given the information to Rob. Billy agreed to meet Robert. $5,000 was exchanged in money and apparently Billy was a former police detective. They also mentioned another name called Jimmy Davis and Rob looked very uncomfortable when this name was mentioned but his attorney told him not to answer any questions on that. There was also another name of a man came named Larry Thompson. These names do come into the case a bit later on so I'm not going to go into too much details on them. You'll find out why they are important later. Police then decided to bring in Saran to speak to her, the woman that he was having an affair with. She tells them the same basically that they began their affair in June of 83, that they were planning on leaving their spouses and that they loved each other. Something she said though that I found very very strange was that she said Rob had asked her if she knew of anyone that could get rid of his wife Maria. She said that she didn't know anyone and if Rob was actually being serious about that that she couldn't be with him because I mean, come on, like, you wouldn't be with somebody who said that. I'm guessing he just brushed it off and just said, no, I'm only joking, kind of thing. But he also said that if he could get rid of Maria, it would solve all of his problems. Hmm. Obviously, at that point, it is not looking really good for Robert at all. Not that it was from the beginning, because this story was just... I don't know. There was a lot of holes in it and a lot of strange things in it anyway. I'm not saying that these things couldn't happen because they could, but it's just all a bit too coincidental, if you ask me. Police were obviously looking into all this. They had the the suspicions along the same lines and they eventually ended up arresting Robert. On the 26th of September in 1984, he was indicted by a grand jury on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder in relation to his wife. So it was believed that he had actually hired somebody to kill his wife and make it look like, you know, a robbery or something like that. The very next day, on the 27th, he checks himself into a hotel room where he attempts to take his own life. But at that point, police were monitoring him and watching him, and when they receive no response from him at 1am, they go in there and they obviously realise his attempt and they take him to hospital. He was unsuccessful in that attempt. When he recovered, he was eventually taken to a psychiatric facility in Philadelphia for a time. So, this is what the police got from it, basically. This is what they believe truly happened. They believe that Robert met Billy on the 18th of June in 1984 at the casino in Atlantic City. Robert offered to pay him $65,000 to go ahead and murder his wife. This was on top of the $5,000 that he had already paid him. He then apparently gave him $7,000, gave him her picture of Maria and the home, and he actually wanted the hit to be carried out that very same night. But Billy did not do that on that night and ended up going back home. Then on the 19th of July, Billy once again returned to Atlantic City. He met Rob again. He once more wanted it to happen that night. He said that he would leave Maria in the car whilst he went out to this restaurant and used their toilet so that he would be out of the way and that would give Billy the opportunity, but he didn't actually manage to do it then because the area that they parked in was very, very well lit and very busy, and so it wouldn't have been prudent for him to just jump out and shoot her, so he didn't do it once more. He then decided to offer him more money. He offered him a further $15,000 for Billy to come back on Labor Day, which Billy agreed to. On the 6th of September, he met Robert at a service parking lot where they scouted out an area that would be good for them to pull over a dark secluded little area to pull over so that he could carry this out. 
that is where they found that picnic area. Which makes more sense that, than him just randomly pulling over inside of it when his tire was flat. At around 9.30, Robert left for a little while. He went to meet, he left Maria inside. He went to meet Billy outside of the casino. He told him that he w- they would be leaving at midnight and that he gave him $800 and said that the other $15,000 he would have to get from his pocket, you know, once he had knocked him out. He then asked for the photographs that he had given of Maria and his house back because he wanted to get rid of those as evidence. So now we're on the 7th because it's past midnight, you know, the pair are traveling home. Billy and Larry Thompson were already waiting in that dark secluded area for Rob to pull up in and Larry Thompson was the apparent shooter. Rob gets out, they knock him over the head, They shoot Maria, who was lying down in the car, obviously twice killing her. And then Billy goes back, slashes the tire for all intents and purposes to pretend that the tire was flat. And then they make it look like a robbery. They take the money from Robert's pocket. They were expecting $15,000, but apparently they could only find two. And they take that and then they just leave. The trial lasted six weeks. But eventually, Robert Marshall was convicted of capital murder on the 5th of March in 1986. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Robert Cumber was convicted as a, an accomplice. He was sentenced to prison but was, re- was released in 2006. Billy McKinnon pleaded guilty to the charge of conspiracy and ended up having a five-year prison sentence but only served one of those, I believe. And he went ahead and testified that Robert Marshall had hired him to kill his wife and that the gunman was actually Larry Thompson. Larry Thompson though was acquitted of murder charges in 1986 due from testimonies from his family that he was actually with them and it was impossible for him to have been there pulling the trigger because he was with two members of family at different times during that day and so you know he had an alibi. That wasn't actually the case though. He ended up in jail years later for other crimes i believed armed robbery and something else that i can't actually remember and whilst he was serving those years in april of 2014 he actually confessed to being the gunman that shot maria marshall but because he'd already been acquitted of that and the laws of double jeopardy and the fact that he can't be tried again for that same case that he's been acquitted for he wasn't be he wasn't able to be tried again for her murder even though he had confessed to it Despite that though, he is still in prison. His earliest parole date is 2071. So, you know, he's going to be away for a very long time. And it just really is a shame that he can't be charged for Maria's murder because he'd already been acquitted. So, as I said, Robert was actually sentenced to death. But he spent many years on death row because New Jersey hadn't actually put an inmate to death since 1963. So he just sat on death row for many, many years. In 1989, a book called Blind Faith was published. It became a bestseller. It was written by Joe McGuinness and it was all around the Marshall case. It was, it gained a lot of sort of publicity and it was done from that. Robert Marshall alleged that he was innocent, that his trial was contaminated by police misconduct and this compromised his testimony and the evidence. In 2002, he wrote a book called Tunnel Vision, which was him trying to show how he was not guilty and how he had been framed. He actually spent 18 years on death row before being resentenced. Apparently, it was because of ineffective counsel at the time of his, his trial, and he was then sentenced to 30 years with the possibility of parole in 2006. He was granted a parole board from March of 2015. His eldest sons, Robbie and Christopher, were infuriated by this. Obviously, he had taken their mother. And so they were furious, they did not want their dad to get out. But his youngest son, John, throughout all of this, was an avid supporter of his father. He did not believe that he killed their mother. He believed that his father was innocent. So obviously you've got two sons who were trying to keep him in jail and then you've got the one son who believes his dad didn't do it. His sons were fighting really hard to not allow him to get parole. Well, two of them, at least, sorry. The thing was though, he didn't actually make it to that parole board. His health had begun deteriorating, he ended up suffering a stroke and after that his health really deteriorated and it was, it was just, his health was not good at all. On 24th of February in 2015, so like, you know, a couple of weeks before that parole board hearing was supposed to be held, Robert Marshall actually died in prison due to natural causes. He was 75 years old at the time throughout his entire time in prison he never showed any remorse but he did actually admit to making mistakes so yeah that is the end of the case 
If you ever liked this video, give me a big thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for similar content. Anyway, guys, that's all I have today on the case of Robert Marshall. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, bye.